This is the podcast of the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our podcast. My name is Anna Duarte and I am a research assistant of the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. Today we are going to talk about third world insights on business and human rights. And I have the pleasure to be with Professor Claire Bright, the director of the center, and Dr. Ibe Honke Udumusu Ayanu. She is an associate professor at the College of Law, University of Saskatchewan. Prior to joining the University of Saskatchewan, she was a sessional lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of British Columbia. She's a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. Honke is a member of the editorial committee of the African Yearbook of International Law. She is also a member of the editorial boards of several journals, including the Business and Human Rights Journal, the Journal of African Law, and the African Journal of International Economic Law. She is vice chair of the Midwest Interest Group of the American Society of International Law, a scholar with research interests in local community engagements with legal and economic structures, foreign investments, human rights, natural resources, and socioeconomic development. Honkert has received several competitive research grants to support her research. She has co-organized and facilitated conference and workshops and delivered lectures and presentations at numerous events around the world. Her research has been published in several leading journals and books, and she is a co-editor of Indigenous Industry Agreements, Natural Resources, and the Law, published by Rutledge in 2020. So, Honke, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what brought you to the field of business and human rights? Um, thank you, Anna, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Claire, for the invitation to share some thoughts about business and human rights today. I appreciate the work that you and Anna have done regarding today's podcast. My journey to business and human rights um, has been, I would say, quite predictable. It is the journey of my research since I was an undergraduate law student. And as a law student, I was quite interested in the regulation of the oil and gas industry in Nigeria. And I started conducting research on the subject. That interest has not waned over time. My master's research investigated gas flaring, which is when I added a Canadian perspective to my work. I also had the opportunity to work with researchers at the Canadian Institute of Resources Law, where I completed one of the Institute's human rights papers. And in my paper for the Institute, I focused on environmental and health rights in Africa. At that early stage, I started to actively incorporate human rights into my interest in oil and gas regulation. I made what I thought was a bit of a turn when I enrolled in the University of British Columbia's PhD program. There, my research focused on international investment law and the settlement of foreign investment disputes. It later turned out to be an excellent combination with my oil and gas research. My PhD was also a time when I began to intentionally study the interventions and roles of third world peoples and states in the international system. So my work in oil and gas, human rights, and international investment law turned out to be a perfect combination for me in studying issues that have now become part of the field of business and human rights. In my current work, I study the interventions of third world peoples and more recently indigenous peoples in the um, international economic system and the simultaneous implications of the system for the rights and well-being of these peoples. And specifically, this broader research focus sees me working in the intersections between international investment law, 
the regulation of natural resource extraction and human rights. And sometimes my work involves exploration of each of these areas as separate areas of research. Thank you so much, Ibiron. It's a pleasure to know a little bit more about yourself. But now, the title of this episode is Third World Insights on Business and Human Rights. And perhaps it's helpful to clarify the terminology that we use. So we sometimes talk about developing countries, emerging world, third world, etc. But what is, in your opinion, the appropriate terminology to use in this case? Thank you for that question, Anna. That is a very important question and one that I think requires a podcast of its own. But I'll attempt an abbreviated response here. Rather than um, identify a terminology that is perhaps the most appropriate, I will talk about why I adopt the terminology third world in my work. Different people, as we know, and organizations refer to areas of the world by different terminologies. And one thing that I have learned in the course of my research is that naming is important. I work in the third world approaches to international law, also referred to as TWIL tradition. And a lot of my work is informed by the importance of examining global issues from multiple lenses, especially those that may not be the dominant views. And in terms of TWIL, third world approaches to international law, I must hasten to state that there isn't one TWIL perspective, but many TWIL and other third world scholars adopt the third world terminology. Um, In the Twelve tradition, the third world isn't necessarily only or necessarily a geographical location. Um, For scholars like Professor Raja Gopal, one should think about the third world as what he calls, and I quote, a counter-hegemonic discursive tool. Um, It is what Professor Kafo calls a crucial analytic category, and that's his language, crucial analytic category. So from scholars such as Professor Karen Mikkelsen um, to Professors James Gaffey and Macau Mutua, we garner that adopting the third world terminology allows us to think beyond singular economic, political, or geographical terms. Um, It permits us to situate relationships in the international system in the context of history, experience, and sometimes resistance. It is ultimately what I've referred to in my work following the insights of these scholars as a site from which an alternative legal order that is representative of the experience and positions of all peoples can be imagined, created, and launched. But of course, sometimes um, one attaches a particular geographical location um, to the third world, uh, but it isn't really only about geography. It allows us to imagine um, beyond single economic, political, or geographical terms. Thank you very much for that uh, very insightful uh, answer, Ramke. And I was wondering if you could maybe now give us a, a bit of a background on earlier views that may have informed the business and human rights movement, in your opinion. Thank you for that um, question, Claire. I'll, I'll continue, um, as I respond to that, I'll, I'll, I'll continue from my discussion um, regarding the third world. And I, I'll say that one cannot separate the third world and the work that was done in the United Nations in the decolonization era of the 1950s to the 1970s from the business and human rights initiatives today. Um, Of course, there are differences. Um, They're quite different, um, I must say. One of the things that are still similar is the location of a lot of this discussion, which is the United Nations. But in terms of contents, there are um, differences, but we can locate the antecedents of today's business and human rights movement um, in this this era. And 
during this time, third world states adopted the United Nations as a forum for seeking changes to the international system. Um, at this time, third world states were looking for a lot of changes to the international economic system. The level of the effectiveness of their efforts and the divide that um, that developed um, or that came up between developed and third world countries at this time has been a subject of debate for decades. And um, it's really beyond the scope of my response to this question, but I thought I should mention it. Um, rather, in, in, in response to that question, I draw connections between today's business and human rights initiatives and earlier efforts to regulate the activities of businesses. Third world states were important in the adoption of the declaration on the establishment of a new international economic order at the United Nations General Assembly um, in 1974. And that declaration viewed the technological advancement that had occurred prior to that time favorably but it noted that the issues that we readily acknowledge as human rights violations today were obstacles to the advancement of third world states and peoples. And it also listed the regulation of transnational corporations as one of its applicable principles. The Charter of Economic um, Rights and Duties of States, which was adopted during the same era, adopted a similar approach, and it affirmed that states have the right to regulate transnational corporations within their jurisdictions. Specifically, the program of action on the establishment of a new international economic order directed one of its 10 sections to the regulation of transnational corporations. It called for the adoption of an international code of conduct for transnational corporations. And according to this program um, of action, the code of conduct was intended to achieve a number of objectives, including ensuring that corporations act in conjunction, um, that corporations did not interfere or act in conjunction with what the program of action called racist regimes. So it didn't want corporations interfering in the internal affairs of host countries, and it didn't want them acting in conjunction with what it called racist regimes. And at the time the program of action was adopted, significant efforts were being directed at addressing racism, apartheid, and colonialism. And a code of conduct on transnational corporations, which called for transnational corporations to respect Human rights was indeed negotiated at the United Nations and the United Nations Center on Transnational Corporations was established. Governments of third world and developed countries were interested in addressing the position of transnational corporations at this time, although their interests in doing so were not always identical. Um, so in this regard, the OECD, for example, adopted guidelines for multinational enterprises in 1976, while these conversations were ongoing. The different interests of various states have been significant um, in the efforts to develop mechanisms for regulating the human rights impact of business. In addition, as we know, state interests are not constant, and as they shift, the state of negotiations of international instruments on business and human rights are also affected. Regardless, the events that occurred around the 1970s, and in particular, the experience of third world countries at this time, remain an important part of earlier international efforts to address human rights violations by businesses. Subsequently, attention has turned towards initiatives such as the UN Global Compact, and later to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Different actors have over time expressed different levels of support for different initiatives. And that demonstrates the state of divide on an issue that has significant implications 
for peoples all over the world, and especially for third world peoples, as well as indigenous peoples. So from calls directing attention to transnational corporations that I have briefly outlined in my response to your question, Claire, the international community has now proceeded to debating a binding instrument on business and human rights. So we keep seeing over time a development of the initiatives directed at business and human rights. Thank you very much, Ranke, for this uh, answer. And I was wondering if you could uh, tell us in your view, what are the possible contributions from the third world to business and human rights right now? Um, that's a very um, important question, Claire. Thank you for that question. And I'd like to start by recalling what Professor Gathi um, had said in his 2020 Grotius lecture. Um, in, in, in that lecture, he noted that the third world is what he called an epistemic site of production of knowledge. And um, he was talking about how the third world is an important site of production of international knowledge. And it, it, in responding to your question about the possible contributions of third world countries to business and human rights um, at the moment, we, we can consider these contributions, I would say, under two broad headings. And that would be first contributions from third world states and second contributions from third world peoples and local communities. My work often considers the positions of local communities. So I'd like to um, continue that approach um, in my response to this question. But before I look at the position and contributions of local communities to business and human rights today, um, I'd, I'd like to start from the contributions of third world countries. Initiatives by third world countries regarding the regulation of businesses within the international system is not new, as I had mentioned in response to, um, I believe it was Anna's question earlier. On contemporary contributions, I'd like to draw some examples from United Nations initiatives, as well as um, some examples from Africa. At the United Nations level, the negotiations right now of a business and human rights treaty and third world countries were essential in the adoption of the resolution of the Human Rights Council that established um, the open-ended intergovernmental working group on transnational corporations and other business enterprises with regard to human rights. And many third world states have also participated in the ongoing negotiation of the legally binding instrument on business and human rights. That is the legally binding instrument to regulate in international human rights law, the activities of transnational corporations and other business entities. The African Commission on Human and People's Rights specifically has offered some insights on, this, um, on these negotiations. Um, the African Commission prepared an advisory note to the African group in Geneva on this legally binding instrument. And in preparing this note, it relied on its working group on extractive industries, environment, and human rights in Africa. And I should note that this working group is also one of the examples of the engagement between African countries and business and human rights issues. But in the advisory notes specifically, um, the African Commission adopts the view that while the current legal regime is important, that current regime cannot fully address the imbalance in power between any obligations that transnational corporations may bear and what the Commission calls, and I quote here, the gravity of the impact of their operations and the scale of power they wield, end of quote. So for the African Commission, this imbalance and other issues can be addressed through a binding legal framework that accounts, amongst other things, for the position of 
vulnerable peoples. So in this advisory note, the African Commission offers some guidance on some of the contested parts of the drafts of the legally binding instrument. And it also outlines principles that it considers important to the debate. Um, to draw another example from Africa, the African Union some years ago began conversations regarding a draft policy framework on business and human rights. And in addition, and this has been the subject of commentary um, in recent years, African countries have been leaders in adopting instruments in the foreign investment area, specifically that include human rights obligations for foreign investors. Um, some examples include the bilateral investment treaty between Morocco and Nigeria. There's also the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS Supplementary Act on Investment. Um, these are instruments that are often cited as examples um, of instruments that are leading the position on human rights obligations of investors. Beyond contributions from third world states though, third world peoples and local communities seek accountability for the human rights violations of businesses. And some of the efforts of these communities have been the subject of commentary in the last few decades. And in particular, the first half of 2021 has witnessed decisions of courts um, in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. And these have also been the subject of commentary. For decades, third world peoples have been trying to seek remedies for harms that they have suffered in the courts of the home states of foreign investors. So, the, so they initiate actions in the courts of the home states of foreign investors. And in the last few years, courts in these states have started to assume jurisdiction to hear these cases. And in the case of Nigerian farmers and Shell, before the Dutch Court of Appeal, a decision was delivered on the merits earlier um, this year. Decisions of the United Kingdom um, Supreme Court in Lingowe and Vedanta in 2019, which involved claimants from Zambia, as well as Opabi and Shell in 2021 with claimants from Nigeria. They're beginning to define the state of the law in that jurisdiction on the liability of parent companies and their subsidiaries. These cases are, however, not only being heard and decided in European courts. In 2020, the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Nefson and Araya addressed claims from Eritrean claimants regarding the activities of Nefson Resources Limited, a Canadian company. And the majority of the court indicated that that claim may proceed. These cases, um, are just examples of some of the cases, and the cases have adopted a variety of arguments that are helping to shape the scope of legal accountability for human rights violations. Third world countries are also establishing mechanisms for holding investors liable through court decisions in their home states um, with instruments such as the Morocco-Nigeria Bilateral Investment Treaty, and the ECOWAS Supplementary Act providing for such options. Nevertheless, third world peoples continue to be major proponents of this option for seeking redress, for seeking remedies for the human rights violations of business. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for highlighting these uh, very important contributions uh, of the third world uh, countries to business and human rights and its development. Thank you very much for this, Ronke. And um, as a last question, um, I would be interested to hear a bit more um, your thoughts on why you think it's not only useful, but also necessary for the developing world to be part of this conversation, to be part of this business and human rights conversation going forward. Thank you very much um, for that question. Claire and um, for all the questions so far. 
as I mentioned in response to one of the earlier questions, third world states and peoples have pioneered and articulated innovative positions in international forums for decades. And um, we won't be able to go into those cases in this podcast. But I would say that the third world must be part of the business and human rights conversation, and not just be part of the conversation, but present pioneering positions, present alternative positions even when necessary, because third world states and peoples are able to offer perspectives and alternatives that would otherwise not be part of this conversation that has had significant implications for these states and peoples. Um, I, I would say that they offer insights from what Professors Engi and Chimney have called the lived experiences of the people of the third world. So beyond participating in the conversation, I would say that third world peoples have over time witnessed significant human rights violations from the activities of businesses. Of course, the third world has benefited from business activities over time as have um, different parts of the world, but third world peoples have also witnessed very significant human rights violations in the process. And many of these human rights violations have occurred in the natural resource industry and in other industries as well. Nigeria's Niger Delta is often cited as an example in this regard. And from environmental degradation in the Niger Delta to multiple violations of the human rights of Niger Delta peoples, and the very real impacts of these on the lives and livelihoods of these peoples, it is clear that it is imperative that the third world is not only a part of these conversations, but is a leader in these conversations. The Niger Delta situation alone, for example, has informed decisions by Nigerian courts, um, the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, courts in the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and other dispute settlement forums. It shows that the business and human rights debate is very real for these peoples. As a result, the position that third world peoples, as well as the states that represent them in international fora adopt, which in some cases may be different from prevailing ideas on business and human rights must be foremost in these conversations. And as I conclude my thoughts on this question and um, in this podcast, I must note that the third world features different ideas, different identities, different experiences, and different interests. And we cannot expect one third world position on all issues. What we can expect is what Professor Mikkelsen has called a chorus of voices on issues that are relevant to the third world. Each actor, states, communities, organizations, corporations, and others will contribute to this discussion in ways that they consider beneficial. But one actor that I want to highlight in this discussion as we bring this podcast um, to an end today is the local communities that are directly impacted by business activities. They have been a group of actors that have been constant in the positions that they have adopted for a long time. And while they may not have necessarily presented their positions in business and human rights language, I believe that these peoples are core actors that we must listen to in this conversation about business 
and human. Thank you, Ronke, for your generosity with your time and with sharing your uh, and sharing your very um, uh, in, insightful um, comments and thoughts with us uh, today um, on this very important topic, which is too often uh, overlooked in academic work, work. But as you pointed out uh, today, um, is absolutely essential for business and human rights and for the future of business and human rights. So thank you so much, Ronke. Thank you very much, Anna, as well. And I will now hand the floor back to Anna. Well, I want to thank both of you for being part of this episode. Um, and I invite everyone to follow the work of Dr. Imbe Ronke and also to follow our work on our center, especially our newsletter, our podcast, and our blog posts. So see you in the next episode and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank, thank you. you.